doing a deep dive into the topic of equity at work. I first want to stand still by what we mean by equity. Equity refers to striving towards fair and equal opportunities in the workplace, acknowledging that biases and structural inequalities exist and will need to be corrected for in order to tr achieve truly fair and equal processes. And equity matters. We know from lots of research that diversity bonuses depend on it. Without equity, biases and structural inequalities can hijack the ability of diversity to live up to its positive outcomes, morally, fiscally, learning-wise. And we know that these challenges are pervasive and hinder equity daily. For example, a study by the Boston Consulting Group said 50% of underrepresented groups experienced biases on a daily basis in the workplace. There's a lot of work to be done on equity. What are tools you could start to be thinking about to move your organization towards equity? Well, the first and most powerful one is data. Data is your most important friend for DEI and for equity in organizations. With data, you can analyze, for example, your pipeline, understand where your pipeline is leaky or having trouble with bias. You know, for example, do the demographics of the people you're interviewing reflect the population, but not those of whom you hire? If so, that would say there's something going on and the interview process is not equitable. Or, for example, is your entry-level employee base fairly diverse, but your manager level isn't? In which case, I'd be investigating what's going wrong with your promotion processes or the daily lived experience of employees. Data is so powerful. It will allow you to fine-tune your efforts on DEI and know how to move towards greater equity in your organization. As you're taking steps once you know where you have trouble spots around equity, one of the most important steps you can take to move towards equity is formalizing procedures. The more that you have rubrics and clear criteria for evaluation, for interviews, for hiring, for promotions, for yearly performance reviews, the more those criteria are clear, transparent, behavior-based, and held to very carefully, the greater the chance you'll have equitable and anti-bias processes within your organization. Additionally, any type of new process you make and formalize could still have bias baked into it. And so making sure that you're soliciting and using feedback, including from the data you're collecting, to continually update your processes to be anti-bias is really important. If you ask employees what tools for equity are seen as most important, one important tool is anti-discrimination policies and making it very clear within the company that discrimination isn't tolerated. Additionally, training those making personnel decisions, managers, HR, etc., on how to mitigate biases and to increase their cultural competency around inclusion is seen as highly valued. And additionally, finding ways to aggressively be anti-bias or to remove bias from those evaluation and promotion decisions is so critical. So let's do a look now at specific tactics you can take to have more equitable personnel processes. The first bucket we can chat about quickly is performance reviews. In order for performance reviews to be equitable, it's really important that employees get the criteria far in advance at the start of the performance cycle upon which they're going to be evaluated. As you're going and giving feedback on a say a quarterly basis as well as a formal yearly review, it's really important your feedback is clear, specific, and that you're checking your bias, including your script for say a feedback session, through a bias checker to make sure that you don't have bias baked into the language that you're using. There's a lot of research showing, for example, that women get vaguer feedback than men, which makes it harder for them to perform because the advice they're getting is much less concrete. So be very mindful of your language in those feedback moments. Additionally, make sure that you're trying to be um, conscious over the quantity of feedback that you're giving to employees across demographic groups and that everybody's getting the same quantity as well as level of detail in the feedback they're getting. Also make clear that you're tying feedback to business outcomes and reminding writers around you of biases as you go. So let's quickly touch base on some of the data why you need to have these procedures for performance reviews. Well, as I mentioned, women are more likely to receive vague feedback compared to men. Additionally, the type of feedback that's given varies. Women are more often told that they're too aggressive, whereas that feedback is very rarely given to men. So reminding writers of biases, the existence of stereotypes, and how to have clear criteria you hold to in these moments and that you're giving feedback that is inclusive is really important. Another bucket in personnel decisions is pay decisions. And this is a great one where it's easy to look at the metrics at the actual numbers and do things like pay gap analyses to ensure that people are being paid equally for the same work and there isn't differences based on gender, race, or other demographics when people are doing the same job. Making salaries public, transparent, and accountable is a great way to be held accountable by others. 
Another way to improve equity and address structural inequalities is to ban salary history in, in the interview process and to make sure that you're truly paying people for the work they do and not just digging into a pre-existing salary history that could have structural inequalities and biases baked into it. You can also look at job ads as a way to promote equity and inclusion. It could be, for example, your company's having a hard time attracting women or people of color more generally. Well, often I hear companies blaming the talent pool, saying these people just aren't there. Well, actually, more often or not, they are, but there's something going wrong in that recruiting process is not drawing in the right set of candidates. You could think about hiring a specialized recruiter, or even a first simple step is to run your job ads through a language editor. Now, I've been working in research in this area for many years, and when we went to hire in our leadership center recently, I ran our job description through a language editor, and I think 25% of my language was too masculine, too aggressive, and women wouldn't have applied to this leadership position because of the language I was using. There's always room for growth and for awareness about how the small words we use, including in job ads, can either pull people to the table or drive them away. Finding ways to be inclusive in your language is really important. Let's look now about how to improve interviews for equity. One important criteria is to ensure that you keep the processes blind as long as possible. This is based on studies done in orchestras. Orchestras for a long time found that they predominantly were choosing male musicians to play in their orchestras. At one point then they decided to put up a curtain and not see the gender of the applicant to the orchestra. This helped, but not entirely. And this is why it's important to have feedback on processes towards equity, because eventually they learned as they were experimenting with blind additions that the curtain didn't necessarily mask the noise of high heels or the clickety-click of the woman walking on stage. There's still room for gender bias to exist and influence the evaluation. So once they put down a rug and a curtain, they found actually that they were admitting an equal number of men and women to the orchestra. As you evaluate your own interview processes, how could you work towards something equally blind? to ensure that gender and racial biases are not seeping into the way in which you evaluate candidates. Additionally, for interviews, it's important to ask the candidates the same set of questions. If we're left on automatic pilot, we often will ask a woman candidate or a person of color different questions than we would ask other candidates. So how can we ensure that we stay on script and use the same questions for all candidates? Additionally, the more that you're evaluating based on behavior versus stereotypes or general qualities, the more you move towards equity. So one great way to look at equity in interviews is to assign a behavioral task where people do an actual part of the job and you can evaluate based on actual behavior. More examples on this. So for example, in interviews of venture capitalists of entrepreneurs, work for example out of Harvard shows that venture capitalists are more likely to ask women questions about how they're gonna manage risk and what would happen if they fail. And venture capitalists then ask men questions about what are your dreams? How are you gonna achieve this big vision of your future? I look at more promotion questions. And because of this then, the information that's elicited in the interviews makes the woman candidate look worse than the male candidate because of the types of questions that were asked. And so it's really important to find ways to figure out where in your interview process you might be having a gendered lens, a racially biased lens, and remove that from every step of the interview process. It matters, you know, going back to that study that I mentioned in startups, when men were asked more opportunity-oriented questions, they raised 7.9 million. When women were asked those questions that were more risk-averse, they only were able to raise 563,000. What a difference. The way that we show up in interviewing candidates has enormous implications for equity. Now, one more bucket of this. Once you have these employees in the door, how do you help them ha succeed on a day-to-day -day basis? And this is where mentoring is really important. In a data collection I did for a company this summer in DEI, of all the levers this company was using for DEI, mentoring was by far the most predictive of equity as well as organizational performance. Having a formal mentoring program is really important. In such programs, it's important to match mentors and mentees on skills and competencies. It's important to formalize the process for learning and development in these partnerships, to train mentors on how to mentor as well as mentees on how to be mentored, and to clarify roles and responsibilities. Another thing to be mindful of, for example, is the culture and the environment of how, what happens when you walk into a company. There's a lot of work on stereotype threat, for example, showing that if you prime people to activate stereotypes, so if you make a girl think about stereotypes on math before she takes a mathematical test in school, um, minorities, women, of, women and people of color perform worse. So if you look around your physical environment, what cues are reifying stereotypes? For example, one university I know, when all the faculty would walk into their offices, used to have 
paintings of all the deans who are all white male as all the faculty will walk into their offices this morning. That literally would prime the brain of any woman or person of color walking into their office to function less effectively. And so then when you look at the gap analysis and realize no woman or people of color were making tenure at this institution, those types of signals on a daily basis had an impact. So as they revised their DEI policy, they moved those paintings to a room of honor, but not one that was in the faces of their diverse faculty walking in the door every day in the same way. And so if you look around you, it's important to analyze. One more bucket that is important to think about for equity, and is an interesting opportunity to go beyond equity and even to look at justice, is pipeline development. Minimally, it's important to think about using recruiters and non-traditional sources for accessing candidates where you can get a greater variety and diversity of candidates into your company. Additionally, if you wanted to go above and beyond and move towards more social justice, as well as a more diversified talent pool, you also could think about investing in, for example, training and development in high school communities, middle school communities for skills that would lead to applicants to your organization one day down the road. And this is important because as we know from a lot of research, most jobs aren't published publicly. And research has shown that anywhere from half to upwards of 80% of jobs come from networking. And presuming our networks tend to be fairly homogenous and who we know informally looks like us, it's really important to find ways to get news of your company of these vacancies out there to a broader and more diverse public. So these are some initial tools for equity. Next up, we're going to dive deep into how do you really fix those decisions when you're deciding which employee to hire or which to promote, and how do you actually run those meetings in ways that can truly move towards equity.